Christ. And um, this new life in Christ, as the end of chapter 3 tells us that this new life in Christ uh, uh, grants us the ability to have a different kind of relationship with people. Uh, one that is not self-oriented, but other-oriented. A, a relationship with people that is, uh, that is interested in their welfare and not just our own. Um, there's, uh, it's a relationship that seeks to honor God and not just position ourselves. It just changes our whole mentality. When we understand that we have a new life and a relationship with God through Jesus, and that the mystery in chapter 1 is that this Christ lives in us. You know, I, I sometimes have a hard time processing that in my head. Uh, can it be Jesus, the one who created all things, and for whom all things were created, the one who took on flesh and lives 33 years here on this earth, and uh, demonstrating the love of God and speaking the love of God, and out of the love of God, offered his life as a sacrifice on the cross to take any kind of judgment or penalty that could ever come to me. He took it upon himself on that cross. And having paid the price for us, has the right to grant to us forgiveness and welcome us into his family. That's just the big story about Jesus. And I said, the scripture teaches that this Jesus, by his spirit, lives in all of us who have come to profess faith in Jesus and his death on the cross for us. Do you, do you recognize that 2,000 years ago, when Jesus hung on that cross, he paid any judgment that could come against us. And having died in our place, says to you and me, believe that I paid the price for your sin. Believe that I am the Son of God. Receive what I have done for you in your mind. If you've come to that place in your own life experience to say, I believe that, and, and I receive the forgiveness of Jesus, and I'm grateful to him that I have a relationship with God the Father now because of Jesus. If that is true for you, it is also true for you and for me that this Jesus, by his Spirit, now is present in your person. That just overwhelms me. I said, why do I think little of myself? Why do, I, why do I subject myself to guilt and feeling less than and unimportant or being whatever the thing is, the down kind of opinion about me? Why do I ever think like that when I know that Jesus, the Son of God, the Creator of all, lives within me? I'm free. I'm free not to be concerned about me anymore. I'm free to care about the people around me. All the need in my life is met and satisfied in Christ. And I said, if I can just get my, my arms around that and in my head begin to see myself as God sees me, I will live differently in this world. And I'll live differently in my relationships with people at home or people around the church, or friends who don't know the Lord. Or as we're going to talk about today, in the workplace. How does this relationship with God and His presence with me affect how I perform my work, how I act out my life at work? And I'm grateful that God has given us a scripture. It's in a written form. And he's given us the ability, the mental ability, to, besides all the languages that we can translate and we have, uh, there was, uh, I did a double major in college. One was philosophy and the other was Greek. And so I've read the New Testament in Greek. And, and, and one of the processes we used in the Greek class is uh, all the students had to take a translation of their own. And they compared, as they read the Greek, they compared the translation. And then we discussed that in the classroom. And most of the translations we have are pretty close. There's some things I would do differently. If, you know, I was the one writing the translation, but most of it is the scriptures that we have are really clear. They got the point down. 
the essence is there. And so I'm grateful that God has given us the ability to have translations that we can pick up on all of our languages, that we have the original Greek, and we have the original Hebrew that the scriptures were written in. And today we're looking at those. And the one we're looking at today is what does your new life in Christ look like at work? And what I want to do with you here first is, uh, let's see, uh, how's this going? Ooh, there it is. I, I have this for you. Can you see me if I stand right here? Can you see the screen? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, to me it's okay. Yeah, you're okay. You already know what's there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, this is just a couple things about work. Work is the source of, one, our identity. When you meet somebody, Maybe about right there. Yeah. The projector keeps. Oh, oh, gotcha. Okay. When you, I lost you over there, Rachel. <laughs> the. Uh, uh, well, maybe I'll move your chair. Or maybe if I step back a little bit, pass that. There we go. We're good. Okay. Uh, you know, when you meet somebody the first time, what kind of conversation do you have? Well, uh, among the first qu questions you ask is, well, what do you do? So my identity is what I do. Where do you live? Um, uh, what brings you here? Or the questions that can start conversation. But among those, almost always, is the question is, what do you do? What do you do for a living? What do you do for life? Uh, what's your occupation? Uh, because that's part of our identity. And our work, it, it tends to, it's a source of our identity, is what I'm trying to say here. Okay, the other, it's a source of income. Uh, you don't work, uh, well, where are you going to get the income? Oh, I know, mom and dad are really wealthy. <laughs> Grandma and grandpa are really wealthy, and they really like me a lot. And so I don't have to work. Anything I need, they take care of, right? Now, how long does that last? Until grandma and grandpa are gone, until mom and dad are gone, and then you're on the street, homeless, because you don't know how to work. So somewhere along the line, work is an important thing to your life in, in having income, having funds to put gas in your car, to buy the car, or at least put gas in the car, to buy insurance, or to buy food, or to get shelter. So you have these things, you have income, but work is also a source of confidence. When, when I apply myself to do something I've not done before, I learn how to do it in a work context, I learned something about the, the working environment, and I learned how to perform the tasks that they want me to do. And as I grow in my ability to do things, so I grow in my confidence. Yeah, I can do that because I did that. And what happens in life, uh, uh, for me, there's an image that I carry. I have a backpack. Well, as, as a high school kid, as a junior high kid, I used to go backpacking in the mountains. And so I put whatever I needed in my backpack because when I'm out there in the mountains, all I got is me and what's ever in my pack. And that imagery has helped me as I look at life. I say, as I live out life, I have new skills, new abilities and things, and they go in my backpack. So wherever I go, I have these skills and experiences that I've learned. And, and, it, and those all contribute to my value, my worth, uh, to other people. I gain respect from other people because of the things that I've done and the quality of work that I do. Confidence and respect come out of work and my own personal worth. My backpack, I have, a, I have a sense of a lot of personal worth because of what's in my backpack today. I worked with high school kids for 20 years on the high school campus, mostly among unbelievers. Saw so many of them come, become believers. And because I was really relating to the high school students, I ended up relating to mom and dad. And so I started relating with families. I learned skills and how to do that, an understanding of what happens in a family con context. And, uh, and my junior high sweetheart said she was willing to live life with me. And uh, we went and made it official and got married. And uh, we've, I've learned through some things about <clears throat> relationship and marriage and family. <clears throat> and I've learned these things and they're in my backpack. So I've learned some relational skills and understanding families and how 
how things work personally. My father was a printer. He was a newspaper publisher. I learned the printing business. I know how to print the old way with ink and water in an offset press or in a, uh, a handset type, in, in a woodblock type. Uh, I can do all these things. I can do a newspaper with, with lead slugs, they call them, that have little letters across them. And you put all these pieces of metal together with the letters and you have a column of print when you run ink on it. I mean, I mean I do I how to do all those things. It's in my backpack. Well, I since then picked up a computer and I uh, spent some time in, in my college days. All my papers were done on a typewriter. Now, you don't even know what a typewriter is. But you, know, there's a, you hit the keys kind of like the computer here, except there's a metal thing that flips up and it, it prints on the paper. It's, it's really a kind of an, an archaic kind of way to do things. But I have a computer now, and I can print in, in a half hour what used to take me four or five hours to do in the print shop. But I have that skill. It's in my backpack now. Uh, so all I'm saying is that work is not only a source of my identity, my income, confidence and respect, but my own personal worth. And I can go into a new situation and I have all these skills and experiences because I've invested myself in working and working well wherever I did. I wanted to learn whatever there was to learn wherever I worked in my life. In the print shop, working with high school kids, being family. I consulted in business for 10 years in strategic planning. I pastored a church for 20 years. I learned the skills of all that. I've learned the skills of study of the scripture, and, and I, I know the scriptures. Uh, and all that's in my backpack. But it would never be there if I didn't take the initiative to work at something. To learn wherever I am, learn all I can about that environment that I'm in. And if you go into life with that perspective, you'll choose work that you're motivated to. You will choose work that you can continue to grow in your understanding and, and wisdom in life. Um, work is a key factor in life. And, and the other thing that I think is important for us to know is that God has given us a responsibility to work. It's not an option. Uh, now, sometimes we can't. Physically, for whatever reasons, we can't work. That's another issue. But if we have to whatever ability we have, God expects us to invest our life in some kind of labor of work. Uh, the first time it, well, the first time it shows up, work shows up in Genesis chapter 1, uh, in God creating all the things, uh, all the creatures and all the, the plant life and everything, and he created man, and he gave to man the responsibility to care for it. That was the first work. But the law, the Ten Commandments of God, we have the commandment, the, uh, the fourth commandment, that uh, six days you will labor, but on the seventh day you will rest. And so, the six days you were labor is a command from the beginning. And then, the, another commandment that's here is that you are to provide for your own. And this was in the letter from uh, uh, Paul to Timothy. He said, if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Now, that's a responsibility a man in God's economy that's the responsibility of a man in a, in a family context, to provide for his own household. And if you don't do that, you're like an unbeliever. You're responsible, uh, negligent. And then another command that's here is that um, work so that you will have no need. And this is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11 says, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. That's in 1 Thessalonians 4.11. Now, I've given you these references in the notes so you can track these back with you. And another one, another reason responsibility to work is that it will not be a burden to somebody else. 
2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 8. We did not, Paul saying of himself, we did not eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with labor and hardship, we kept working night and day so that we would not be a burden to any of you. Just a picture of Paul and his understanding of work. That uh, even though he had a right to request, because he served them as a teacher to them, uh, as a leader in the church to them, that he had a right to claim uh, some kind of remuneration. But to the Thessalonians, he didn't. He worked himself as a model to them to, to be about uh, caring for yourself and investing your life, the skills that you have. And then the, the really tough one here, is 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, if anyone is not willing to work, then he's not to eat either. <laughs> don't work, don't eat. Uh, that's a pretty harsh uh, statement, but that just puts to the level of the level of responsibility that God gives us to work if we have the ability and opportunity to do that, to pursue it. Um, I want to say in relationship to that, I, I had the skills to run the printing business that my dad owned. And when I, when I graduated from college, a year before I graduated from college, uh, my dad let me know that he was keeping the business to give to me if I wanted it. And that was a very difficult thing for me because uh, I wanted to honor my dad but I really didn't want to spend my life working with machinery, printing presses. I just, I felt like, I felt like God made me to be with people. I found my fulfillment being with people. Uh, I found that uh, uh, I was useful and helpful to people. And I said, I just think I need to be involved in people kinds of things and, and not machinery or even in data kind of stuff. I can count, I can keep track of stuff, I can be an accountant, I just don't want to be an accountant. That's, I want to work with people, not stuff, in my mind. Although, that's valuable and necessary, and some really enjoy that. And I say, I'm grateful to God that He made us all necessary to each other. But here I am, uh, I'm in a place, I had to make a choice, and I had to tell my dad that I, dad, I Thank you, but I just, that's not what I think I'm supposed to be about. And he sold the business, pretty much gave it away <laughs> at, at that point in time. It was also a transition in the industry of moving to computers away from all the equipment and stuff that was in the shop. But uh, I made that decision because I had some understanding about myself. Because the environments of work that I had at that point in my life helped me to see what I want to do or not want to do. Now, do you want to spend the rest of your life in the restaurant business? Does that sound an exciting, exciting thing to you? Could very well be, but you'd have a sense of what fulfills you, what gets you up in the morning. Is that exciting for you? Is there, are there things about what you're doing that, you know, I'd like to keep doing those kinds of things in my life? Uh, or not. You know, I said, I don't know, can you become a professional athlete? You know, can I can I be macho man and you know and take on the world and you know and be sponsored by a variety of product companies and things that and I could, you know, perform with my body because I really enjoy that. Or you know, or I really like working with numbers or figures or calculations and, and maybe engineering is the kind of thing I could move into, I could do that. Or you know, what's in your heart to do? Do it. Whatever your hand finds to do that's good, do it. So those are some thoughts about work. In all labor, there is profit. But mere talk leads only to poverty. Someplace there's the applying of your life and your, your energy, your mind to work do things that result in some kind of problem. And uh, in this context, I don't want us to lose track. We have a responsibility to work and do these things, but I want us to understand this in the context that's another truth, and that is that God is our provider. 
uh, this would be in, uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 33. I'm not going to read it all to you, but the, the story there simply is, uh, don't, don't be anxious about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, a roof over your head. Don't be anxious about those things. God knows about those needs. He takes care of the birds. He takes care of the flowers in the field. And you're far more valuable to Him than all these things. Oh, you of little faith, believe Him. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all of these needs He will add to you. God is our provider. Condition is putting our trust in Him. Acknowledging our dependency on Him. Trusting Him for that. And He'll provide for us and meet our needs. Uh, has He done that for us all these years, David? I've, I've given, I've had, I've not had to give much thought at all to the finances of life. Because God has just taken care of us. We've not had a big want. And making a distinction between need and want is a helpful thing to do in life. Um, but we both grew up in a, in a small country town and, and just didn't have a lot of need. Just the basic needs of our life were satisfied and so we've been able to live in that kind of context. But even in the folks of most of our life has been spent in a ministry context that uh, uh, wouldn't necessarily be regarded profitable in terms of finances. But God has taken care of us in all these years, provided for everything we need, and even to this day, we're okay. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, verses 15 and 19, Paul was telling the, the Philippians in the letter, he said, I want to thank you for your generosity to me, your gifts to me. And just know that as you give, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. That's verse 19. Just know as, as, as you find the ability, desire, and ability to give to somebody else in their need, God is going to continue to provide for your need. He will provide all of your need out of his riches. Uh, remember the, the verse of scripture that uh, uh, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And yeah, we have a song about that even too. Okay? And there, there are times as a, as a young man, I used to say in my prayer, I got to say, God, is there, is there a cow out there on the hill you might slaughter and so we could have some, <laughs> you know, whatever we need? Uh, you have all the needs, you have the way to take care of us. But, and the, uh, Another thought that's been helpful to me, and that is that uh, God gives uh, gives to us as we rest in Him. He's the provider. Uh, Psalm 127, 2 uh, says, It is vain for you to rise up early and to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors. It's vain to do that. For he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. Now, that doesn't leave room for me to be slothful, negligent. You know, I really doesn't matter what I do or don't do, God's going to take care of me. Somewhere in this, what I've tried to say at this point in time is that in God's economy, he expects us to be responsible and to work and put our hands to the things he gives us. And through that, he provides for us. And one of the ways that has helped me sort that distinction between responsibility and God's provision is that I receive checks or payment for things in my life. And I just remember it doesn't matter whose signature's on the check, it came from God. Everything that we have, I have acknowledged as a gift from God. And that mentality has helped me to understand I need to be responsible with what he gives me to do. And I know that he's going to take care of us. And he does. So I just wanted you to see that, that you know, that the part about it, it's vain to get up early and stay up late and work hard. I, I, don't, I, I haven't processed that well in my own life because I still do that. I think probably because I grew up in a home in which my father worked 
12, 14 hours a day. Um, every other year, he'd take a week off. <laughs> but that's the environment I grew up in. So I feel like I'm negligent, irresponsible if I'm not active as long as my brain's awake. Uh, but I'm still learning this one, that I can rest. I, you, don't, you don't need to drive everything into the ground in your life. Uh, rest. That's a requirement of God as well. On the seventh day, work six, rest. But um, in principle, <clears throat> two things about, about career, about work that have been helpful to me is a man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. God has given, God has gifted all of us. And as you experience life, as you invest yourself in doing things, that gift surfaces. It became pretty clear in my life that, that I was supposed to be about people and about faith. There are a lot of things that I could have done, but I just knew that that was what I was supposed to do. I don't know how that lines up in the gifting that you find in uh, Ephesians uh, or 1 Corinthians, uh, Romans, uh, 1 Peter, um, four places where there's listed a, a list of gifting. Uh, somewhere in all that, I'm not sure he's given me a gift of teaching. I like to teach, but I think there are a lot of people that have got a better job of that than I do. Uh, there are just things in the book I want you to all know, and I will do all that I can to help you embrace that, understand it, make it useful for yourself. I find it easy to be generous. There's a gift, a, a, a gift of giving. I don't know if that is or not. Um, there, there's a gift of being able to foresee. I'm able to envision things that a lot of people around me don't envision. So I don't know if those are gifts or not, but in any situation I'm in, I seek the welfare of whoever I'm with. And I just find that is a gift from God. And it, is, and it has, in fact, taken me before a great man. I was able to give a, a book on economy written from a biblical value system, the whole book, and in French. And I was able to give that to the president of the Central African Republic. Who would have access to, to a man of that stature and place to be able to put something that is God's truth in his hand that he may weigh it and may be helpful to him as he would make decisions concerning his country? I said, that's pretty cool. In my years of consulting, I was uh, in the presence and helping process thinking with, with people that were worth mega millions of dollars. And who am I? You know, I have $5,000 in the bank. <laughs> but I don't, I don't need all that today, so I'm really wealthy. You see what I'm saying? But God puts you in places that normally others may not have, but because of your gifting, people will seek you. So what is that gifting in your life? And you're going to find it by applying your life in places. God is our provider. For not from the east or from the west or from the desert comes promotion. But God is the judge. He puts down one and he exalts another. You want to grow up in a, company, in a, in a business, in a work, in a situation you're in? Just be faithful in what you do, do it with all your energy, learn all you can, be engaged in it with, with yourself, your person. Uh, don't be slothful about it, don't be uh, negligent, and don't be lazy, uh, and God will lift up and give you opportunity. There are a, a couple other things uh, just to bring to you just your attention here, it's, and this is that uh, you are a worker, what is the, what our text that we're looking at here today? Um, Colossians chapter 3, verse 22. Uh, let's see what we got here. Slaves, it says, in all things obey those who are your masters on earth. In our cultural context today, the equivalent would be slaves, employees, and sometimes feel like a slave in some places, right? But in all these things, obey those who are your masters your employer. 
in our culture here today, we don't, we don't tolerate slavery. Um, but see in the context what's the principle for us about work. Employees in all things obey those who are your employers on earth. Do what you've been asked to do. If it's moral, it's ethical, you know, but uh, if there's tasks that they've asked you to do, do it. And do it with a willing heart and do it with all your energy. But I don't like wiping tables. Do it and do it spotless. Don't leave any room for someone to complain about the quality of the work you do. And it will elevate you. And don't do it with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Do what you do, not because that's just what you've been asked to do. Do what you've been asked to do and do 10% more. Do more, than, do more than what's expected if you have the time and ability and can do that. That proves that there's more to you than most. And that will elevate you in relationship and work. And God just, God just says, do, what, do, what, do what's expected of you, in that, and you'll do well in your working relationships. Uh, be lazy about what you do. Be disgruntled about what you do. Say, okay, if I have to, I will. You know, that's not going to take you anywhere in relationships in a workplace. The God who created all things, the one who took on flesh and lived out life here, the one who offered his life for you, is with you. Honor him with all that you do. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. A man has hired you in your work. Honor him by being obedient to him. But no, in God's mind, he's telling us to think in terms of our service is we're serving our boss, but we're doing it in a manner that honors God. I'm here to serve the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. God's going to reward me for being faithful in my life to do the best I can to honor Him in the things that I do. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. That's the Colossians story. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. Sure, change your boss. There's going to be a consequence someday. Tell a lie. Someday it's going to surface, and there'll be a consequence for that. Be a person of integrity. Be a person of... Uh, uh, diligence, responsibility, uh, and you not you honor God, you honor yourself, and you honor your employer. Uh, these are all things that, that can come for us, instructions to us. Paul to Timothy says, All you who are under the yoke as slaves are to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. If I have identified myself as a believer in Christ, and I, and I live my working relationships in, in uh, dishonorable ways, it's going to reflect on my faith. How many people have you met, even in, early in your life at this point, how many people in your life have you met who are not believers today and say, I'd never be a Christian. I know a Christian and that's what they do. I don't want to be like that. You know, I want my life to be the kind of person, the testimony, that when someone says, what is a Christian, they see what's in my life and that's desirable to them, not a repulsion. And that's what Paul was telling Timothy. Regard, your, regard those that you serve worthy of all honor so that God will not be dishonored. He goes on to say, those who have believers as their masters must not be disrespectful to, for them, to them because they're brethren. You know, if, you're, if your employer, your boss is a, is a believer, maybe a member of the same church, and if they offer you a job for work and stuff, I don't take advantage of the close relationship and, and ask for special things from them or to be slapped in, in how you do your work because they're gracious and they're understanding. Uh, be diligent about your life and all you do. 
and even more so if they're believers. A couple thoughts that have been helpful to uh, do what is expected in your workplace and go up. Don't do what is expected and go down and out the door. <laughs> Meet the expectations. Here's another one. Excel. Do what is excellent and you will gain the reward. Do what you do out of excellence. Here's another one. Are you about winning or getting by? Do you do just enough to get by or you do enough to be the best? The passage, 1 Corinthians 9.24, the statement Paul was making in the Corinthians was that uh, if, you're, if you're a runner and you're going to run a race, run it in such a way that you may win. Don't just participate in the race. Give it your all. Be the best you can be. Run in such a way that you may win. And, uh, uh, and then there's the last verse in this passage. It's the first verse of chapter 4. It says, so you're the boss. You're the employer. God has words for you too. Uh, masters, I grant to your slaves, employers, grant to your employees justice and fairness knowing that you too have a master in heaven. Treat your employees like you like God to treat you. Now, I can think back of a lot of relationships with people who, I know these principles in scripture, but the environment that their work is, is uh, probably an earthly example of what hell may be like. That it's, there's no there's no respect. Uh, everyone is mistreated, abused, uh, underpaid. Uh, and uh, I said, how do I, in that kind of environment, do what God calls me to do as an employee? Give it my best. It's not fair. But being disgruntled, fighting against, doesn't honor God. And it certainly doesn't bring any honor to me in the eyes of the people that I'm working for. But if I choose to be the best I can be, and regardless of the environment, if I choose to be the best I can be, I will influence those who lead. I have influence on life of us. And it could be that just my presence will be the only witness to this man of God and the grace of God in Christ. Can I weigh life like that? Can I think in those kind of terms? Ephesians is a parallel passage to the letter to the Colossians. And in Ephesians, Paul wrote, and masters, do the same things to them, and give up that is doing good, seeking good for them. Do the same things for them, and give up threatening, knowing that both their master, the employee's uh, master, and yours is in heaven, and there's no partiality with God. Whether you're the boss or the worker, God sees us as one. There's no partiality in that. And how will these characteristics affect you in your workplace? What happens if you choose to obey your boss and respect him or her? Uh, what would happen in your workplace if all of your work you serve with a sincere heart and not a disgruntled um, not a, uh, I'm looking for a way to get back, or I'm looking a way to do it, uh, get out of doing something. You know, I serve with a sincere heart. And I serve with a fear of God, a respect for God, because the boss may not see me, but God sees me all the time. <laughs> now, can, am I serving my boss in a, as I would serve God? Uh, what would happen in the, how I do my work? What would happen in the workplace if that's how I related? If I remember that I answered to him? 
What would happen in the workplace if I, if I do all of my work cheerfully, with energy, heartily, and I do it as service to the Lord and to my boss and to my fellow workers? What would happen in your workplace if the boss treated everybody justly and with fairness? What would happen if the boss had a respect for the Lord as the Lord calls us to have? See, I want to say these characteristics that are given us in this text are all things that would change our working environment. And I come back to these three verses I gave you last week and we looked at some weeks before that. Uh, here in Colossians chapter 3. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Maybe it'd be good if you just memorize those five characteristics. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And occasionally, maybe at the end of the week, say, so in what ways did these kind of characteristics show up in my life this week? And where what showed up in my life was just the opposite, how might I have treated that conversation or that work or differently that it would reflect these characteristics? Don't put on the old shabby jacket. Put on the really nice blazer to go to work. Put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord has forgiven you, you also should forgive others. In the workplace, beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity in any relationship. The other verse in 17, chapter 3, is whatever you do in word or deed, you all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So this is the instructions we're getting about relationships and work. And I give you some extra stuff, just in kind of defining work. But uh, hey, I'm uh, I'm 12 years past retirement. But I still have energy, I still have life, and I'm not gonna I'm not going to slow down for something that I don't have. I, don't, I mean, when my body slows me down, I'm going to slow down. It's, it's, it's doing that a bit these days. Isn't it? But uh, I just said, I think God, if God has granted us another day on this earth, it's for a reason. Serving the well planet. So, I'll leave you with that. The, uh, I think it's yours now. Yes. Okay. Okay.